You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and here we have a guy that didn't finish in the top three in one or two, but three tournaments this past weekend. He was part of the NVKBA, the MAKBF, and then the overall KBF events. In the NVKBA, Northern Virginia Kayak Association, he came in first place, 88 inches. And I always wanted to do, just always kind of do some math with this, because I feel like one thing that there's a bridge gap between boaters and kayaks is the conversion. Because if you're if you're on a boat, whether it's electric motor only or any boat, you say best five goes for this weight. So to give you an idea, 88 inches divided by five, you're talking about a 17.6 per fish, per, per one. So you're talking about three and a half plus pounds, you think, relatively, worst case scenario? Yeah, they were pretty heavy. They were, uh, yes, on the Potomac, a 17 is a pretty, pretty heavy fish this time of year. Hey, Justin, you did an, an amazing job, and I de- and we're definitely going to get into his tournament success. But with always, guys, I think it's not just about the tournament and the baits; it's also about the person and their backstory. And I always find that fascinating because you know whether it was like Nico Bates and learning that this guy was a trapper in the woods of Virginia, mm-hmm. learns Japanese, moves over to Japan, and creates Nico Bates. Like how that's crazy, and everyone's got cool stories like that. And and, and I want to start with you, Justin. Like, how did you get into kayak fishing? Where did this all begin for you? Kayak fishing for me, it, I want, I guess it's been about 15 years, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. As I'm getting older, it, it gets fuzzier. But uh, I had a, a Bass Pro Shops Pond Prowler that I got right out of school. Um, you know, that was my first boat. And I was going around to places like Burke Lake and other, other Northern Virginia, kind of little, little small bodies of water. And I saw some videos on YouTube that Chad Hoover and Jeff Little did. And it, it looked cool. Um, you know, I, I watched enough of them. I was like, Hey, maybe I'll give it a try. And I bought the first kayak probably 15 years ago. And, uh, I, I moved about a year after that, just sort of switched departments, uh, in Alexandria. And I realized that from the time that I bought the kayak, I had not launched that, that pond prowler a single time in that year. So the pond prowler got sold and I've, I've been in a kayak ever since. I didn't know you were an Alexandria boy. That's awesome. Yeah. I uh, I grew up in Southern Virginia and then went to school and then started working in D.C. And I was in Alexandria for, I guess it was 13 or 14 years. It was it was a while. How hard was it for you to now? So I, I spent the first 13 years of my life living in Vienna um, before I moved out to Loudoun County, which at that time was like just the Wild West. Now it's basically what the richest it's California 2, 2.0. But, well, uh, all the reds or not not Redskins anymore. What, whatever they are now, commanders. That's, yeah, the, the commanders, the Washington rejects is what they really are because they will never <laughs> win anything. I, we're, we're a caps town. I mean, with Ovechkin, will live and die uh, as probably DC's greatest sporting treasure. We could do a whole episode on on the sports and the Nationals. Oh my God, you sell oh, how man. much talent? Good God! Oh, I, I was disgusted after the. Uh... <laughs> After they won the series and just the, the amount of talent that left when Trey Turner left, I was just like, you got to be kidding me. Why, why would you not sign that guy? Oh, fun fact. I think we're the only team in history to have a guy win the home run derby and then we sell him at the end of the year. <laughs> Bryce Harper is number one. Can you guess who number two is? <laughs> yeah. Soda won it. And then we all floated him. It's just it's it's criminal. Yeah. And. But like with that said, with, with the Alexandria, it's not necessarily a outdoors paradise and neither was Vienna. So when you made that transition, it must have felt pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit. Um, you know, coming to the city was different, but I knew of the Potomac at that point. I I, I can't remember what year it was, but I, I fished a couple of BFLs as a co-angler oh, cool. right around the time I got out of school. And I think. The one I did a couple on the Potomac, and that was the first time that I was really exposed to grass, like that type of grass, just big, thick grass beds. And um, I loved it. And so that was kind of that was where I wanted to go. I knew that I was close to the Potomac. I knew about lots of other little there's some little sneaky lakes that I won't I won't name that I that I like. Um, It's all those Rustin lakes and those little like 
those those sneaky things. Um, mm-hmm. And there's some surprisingly big fish in some of those places. It, it's it's insane, and I just wish some of those were more open to the public. Um, just just more like just to have like kids fishing derbies, things like that. Because I know like Beaver Dam Reservoir in Leesburg, I think it's Beaver. Or Lake Manassas is a great example. I really wish Lake Manassas was open just to give yeah. like kids kids a chance to fish. Um, but I, I digress a little bit there. When you, I didn't know you fished BFLs though as a co. How long were you a co angler for? I did that for just a couple of years, um, and I got to the point where I don't even remember what that there was. There was a term. Like I don't know if it was back back seated or back boated, like where you you be fishing docks or something, and the you know the pro has the boat set up and he fishes it, and you're out in the middle of the lake. And um, after that happened a couple times, I didn't like the uh, being a co angler too much, so I pr- primarily fished it. I did a few on the bay, and then I did a few on the Potomac because they couldn't really back seat you. You're it's grass fishing most of the time, and I felt like I had just as much of a chance. Uh, as the guy in the front of the boat. So I, I really liked the Potomac for that reason for tournaments. But I think it was like 2008, 2009, probably when I when I did that. Hmm. And then after, I like it. I, I probably, I'm too competitive. And, I, you know, I thought I was, uh, was probably better than I was at the time. So my thinking was, this is how I'm going to get a bass boat. I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, win a local one or, qualify for a regional and win a, a bass boat in one of those tournaments. Um, so I was competitive with it. I wasn't really trying to learn. Um, you still pick up some things from different people. But after a, a few times where, you know, once I lived in Alexandria and was on the Potomac a lot, um, you know, you get, a, you get a bad draw or somebody that's just not from the area and doesn't fish it much. And I'd be sitting there in the back of the boat, you know, we're not catching anything. And, you know, I, I had a boater ask me one time, where, where do you think we should go? And I'm like, well, the place that I want to go, we can't get this boat in there. <laughs> it's uh, it's way back in this creek. And but I mean, I'd, I I felt like I could go in in my kayak and and have you know a good day, catch 14, 15 pounds somewhere a lot of the year. And, you know, when you go out there and you spend you, I wouldn't have to spend any extra money for an entry fee. And it just it got to where I, I just kind of. I didn't see a whole lot of point to doing the the co-angler tournaments anymore. And once I had the kayak, it, you know, it opened up a lot of different places I could fish. You know, you can fish the big water like the Potomac, or you can fish a place where it's, you know, electric only or no motors at all. And you got to drag the kayak, you know, and you're fishing a place that's not getting pounded uh, by tournaments constantly. So there's, I I feel like there's plenty of opportunities in Northern Virginia. if you sort of know how to, how to go about it. And, and a kayak helps. It really does. And I think I mean, we were talking a little bit before we got started. Like that was something I think kayaking its niche is like, you can get it into places that you can't get a bass boat. And when you stay in that lane, it is beautiful, whether it's floating a river or you're on a little like sneaky lake or something like that. And I don't know, honestly, how much longer co-anglers are going to be a thing. I really don't because you have so many other options. Like, would you rather pay, it, the comment section is going to like tell me when this thing gets uploaded, how wrong I am, but it's, let's say it's 200 bucks for a co-angler fee. Cool. Or you could go fish a KBF event and you're not spending $200 on that entry fee. And, and it, like it, I, that, that feels like a dinosaur that's just going away. It really does. It well, It definitely, it's gone away from the, the top tier boat tournaments. And I, I still see value in it. If you're trying to learn, um, but I don't know. You look at like the elites when they did away with Coes, they've got a marshal program and you can probably learn more as a marshal than you could as a co I would, because when you're just sitting there watching them all day versus, you know, kind of you, when you're fishing yourself, you're not, you're not really paying attention. You, you pick up on some stuff, but when all you're doing is sitting in a boat and kind of front row seat to a pro, um, you can learn a lot, I think. Yeah. And honestly, that would change the dynamic at BFL so much. Um, and that's actually a good question to put on my channel, because I think if you asked boaters, if they paid a little bit more, they would not want a co-angler. But I think they don't understand like how much that would affect their decision making, because there's so many times, even when I was a young gun, your co-angler could save your ass. But then you're completely alone with your decisions. And that's also what makes kayaking I like about it 
because no matter what level you are with kayaking, it's just you, you know, hmm. unless you are at the I'm really going to say the Bassmaster level or the MLF equivalent, you have a co-angler in the boat, period, whether it's the Toyota series or the Bass Opens. So you have other voices. You can watch somebody else catch something. You know, you're getting your ass kicked throwing a crankbait in the front by the guy throwing a stick worm. You can make that adjustment. Well, if you're in a kayak tournament, unless you're fishing near somebody, it's just you, baby. And you are going to live or die by those decisions. And that is hard. And I didn't realize how hard that is until you end up doing that, whether it's in a boat or a kayak. It, it is, but it, I think that's also the beauty of it. Like to me, that's why it's fun to compete out of the kayak where I control my own destiny. There's not, I mean, sure. You've got all these, these variables that, you know, mother nature is throwing at you, but it's, it's like, you're the one that's making the decisions. Am I gonna, am I gonna stay here? Am I gonna make a bait change, a color change? Like all those decisions are on you. And, and like you said, unless, unless you happen to be around somebody and, and see them doing something. Um, you really don't have any other any other feedback other than what you do yourself. So it's it, you can you can definitely bomb have some have you can ride the struggle bus, but it's also extremely rewarding when you you know you kind of figured it out yourself. You did it yourself. Um, and I think some of the rule changes they made for this year on the the national trails helped that. At one time you could. Uh, What's what's the word? I guess you call them information rules. Like you could contact somebody on your phone, you know, call your buddy up and say, "Hey, hey, you, know, I'm uh, I'm smashing them on this, or I'm catching them on this, or hey, I'm struggling. Are you catching them on anything?" And that they've pretty much done away with. Um, so it's it's really leveled the playing field, I think, to where there's there's really no excuses. If if you don't do well, it's you had a bad day, you own it. If you do well you you had a good day and you own it so it's i really like that aspect of it and, and with that said with, with, with trials and tribulations so to speak this is your third year competing um on a, a bigger scale and mm -hmm. I, I remember last year from nvkba talking to mike ortega shout out who runs MV, nvkba you know you did you did really well last year came close you're going back into it this year um all the events are a little bit later on in the season, which I think is very smart because the small craft advisories in March and early April are very consistent. And I think it's more of a safety thing to push it off just a little bit to where you might not die. Out there. Yeah. And that, like so far, I think this is the first year that there was a national trail that, that canceled the day, uh, which is saying something. I mean, I think it's good that they did with the, the weather that was predicted. But, you know, Hobie canceled a day on uh, on Santee. And I mean, that was, well, I guess that was April, early April. Mm -hmm. So you start doing very many March tournaments and, you know, it's just the water's cold. And if, you know, wind gets up, you know, you, it, it's easy to end up wet or in the water with uh, with a kayak. If you, know, you, you make one mistake and it can be a really bad day. So. And we had pretty stable weather going into this. So, I mean, let, let, let's kind of set the stage here. How everyone has their own ways of fish or practicing for tides. And I do think tides give locals a, a distinct advantage compared to people that are outside. Example is I was fishing a little tournament with some veterans on Sunday. I think we were like 10, 15, 20 boats um, taking veterans out. And I ran into a guy. He had a Hobie 14. He was fishing the KBF and he's from he's from Lake St. Clair. And he's never been there before. And he's like, I don't even know what the hell I'm doing um, because he didn't know how this whole tide thing works. So I do think locals do have a distinct advantage, especially because you how you can practice and work that towards your favor. What was your strategy practice wise going into this? Practice, I, I looked at the weather a little bit and it was it was relatively stable leading in, but there was a lot of rain in the forecast. And I like, like when I lived in Alexandria, uh, it was a lot easier for me to get on some of the, 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 the water that's in DC, which technically was off limits for these tournaments or on some of the stuff that's, you know, just outside of DC, uh, which would have been inbounds for this tournament. Like that's the stuff that I was most familiar with. You know, you, you get off work and you, you explore that stuff. Um, 
I've definitely spent plenty of time further south, but I've I've got some places up near the city that um, I would really love to win a tournament there. That's kind of where I the first places that I ever had the kayak. Uh, but with the weather, I just I know it gets so dirty up there uh, in the springtime that I, I just kind of ruled that option out. In years past, I've spent some time up there, and I, I've I've made the mistake of trying to go too many places, and like, for example, like if you're going to go to, you know, Mata Woman, everybody knows is a, a great tributary. But if you're going to try to make a, you know, say you find some fish in Mata Woman and then you want to go to Aquaya. Yeah. You know, I've done that, <laughs> that is, that's going to take you forever, even if there's no traffic. Um, it's a, it, it's just, it's not good. And it's not a, it's not a good strategy to have your, 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 your two fishing holes or your areas that far apart. And I've done that before, you know, just gone, well, I like this spot and I like that spot and I like this spot. And you've got a whole bunch of places where you've got fish, but you you can't really go from one to the other. So I, for this one, I pretty much, um, I've I've spent some time in Aquaia. Um, I know there's, you know, there's community holes down that way. And I've, I wanted to check those first. And it took me a bit to run into some fish down there. But once I did, um, I found a couple of, of spots you know, in these, these grass beds that were, that were good, um, caught a couple fish. And then I, I, I don't like to catch too many in, in a, a practice situation. I've, I've made that mistake too many times too. A couple years ago, I was getting ready for a Potomac tournament. And I think I put up high eighties to nineties, like three or four days in a row, different, different sections of the river. But I mean, I just, everywhere I went, I smashed them. And, uh, then I went back in the tournament and surprised they don't bite. So how the hell do you practice with like a crankbait? Because ever I've I was told as a youngster by kids like, oh, you can shake them off the crankbait. Bullshit. The only thing I feel like I can do is throw a worm or something I can crimp the one hook on. And that's my practice bait because it, it is so hard to shake fish off of different things. Yeah. I screw locks um yeah. are what I like to use for plastics. And you know, no matter how bad they want to hold on to it, they're they're not gonna I mean, unless they I've never had one straight swallow it, but um, that's one way to not hook them. I've, I've had too many times where I just try to, you know, give them slack where you, you still have a hook in there and it does not work. They manage, they just, they manage to hook themselves. Um, it, it also, this is a random side note. I didn't realize like it is so hard when you're younger and you're trying to detect a bite, just understand for the kids that are listening, you'll feel it because the amount of times when I was younger, I was trying to shake fish off for college tournaments and I left the damn hook in a jig and I still hook them. Like when they eat a bait, it's insanely hard to miss it. They will just swim with it indefinitely until you put a lot of pressure on them. Mm -hmm. That is, that is definitely true. And the, with crankbaits, I've tried to practice with the crankbaits with, you know, taking the hooks off or rolling the hooks and it, it doesn't work. It's for, for me. It doesn't, I, I'm yeah. not good enough with it, but I, maybe other people can, you know, without the hooks on there can actually detect the strike. But for me, it's, you know, it's impossible to tell if that was, you know, if I ticked a rock, or if I take a piece of grass, or if that was a, a fish that, that bumped it. I don't know how, I don't know people, I'm sure there's somebody out there that can, but I, I can't say definitively, oh yeah, that was definitely a fish that, you know, when, when I felt the crankbait bounce off something, it, it I've, I've just found that if I'm going to crank you know, I'm going to hook it and I just, it means I got to put the bait down. You know, if I find an area with some, you know, some hard structure, I, I crank a tree, a lay down or something and, and catch a fish. All right. Well, I know there's some fish in the area and now that, that rod just has to go down because you, you can't shake them off. What's, what was it? The quality of fish that you chose acquire? I mean, you know, yeah. and for people that aren't from the area that are listening, I know I have a lot of guys from the, the Carolinas and Tennessee that listen, the Potomac's a big area, and, but then you do have these specific places. You got the beach, which is down in Aquia. You got Belmont Bay, Matta Woman, Pohick. Like you have these these areas that are just massive grass flats, um, and they're a little bit of a jaunt, especially like you said. Like to give context, if you're from Matta Woman to go to Aquia, was that an hour and some change drive? Maybe probably Please. longer. Yeah. You got to go all the way into the city and then come all the way back down to Fredericksburg. I mean, that's it's an it's a haul. 
so you saw, or maybe it wasn't just what you saw, like the quality of fish was better to make that your go-to decision then. Yeah, I kind of ruled Mad Woman out this time. Um, the I just know it. I mean, everybody knows how good it is. And yeah, there's no spoilers. I, I know there's been past tournaments where it's just it's really crowded in some of those areas. And I try to avoid the crowds if I can. Um, I would rather fish one of the community holes with a bunch of boats over fishing an area with kayakers because the the kayakers, you know, they can't make a long run and go somewhere else. They, they tend to be very thorough. Um, and I just feel like I, I feel like fishing behind a kayaker, I'm not going to do as well. The boater might pull in there and throw a moving bait for a little bit and then jet out of there. Um, maybe, I don't know if that's, if there's any validity to that, like if I'm, if I'm right in thinking that, but that's, that's kind of what I think. Yeah. Like, I, 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 I agree that. with you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, oof. That's a hard one because I, I truly think as a, the Potomac river, it's really hard to find a, a sneaky deal that lasts long. It's because if you find a sneaky deal, it probably won't have the same number of fish in it. So you really got to make sure you stick every single one compared to like the big grass flats where you know like there's enough but there's going to be 600 boats on it so yeah. it's like that that give or take um i do think belmont and aquia can uh, absorb more people than mad woman definitely like i think it's just a bigger area for sure yeah and i went up to what where did i go was it thursday yeah thursday i went to uh, i launched out of pohick and i got bites and i you know i shook some fish off uh, initially and then it just the ones that I stuck were were not the right quality I don't know that I had a fish over 16 inches um, and once I decided I wasn't going to go there I just had some fun and, and caught more fish than I usually will in practice mm -hmm. but I mean I, I probably caught a dozen that day and not one of them was over 16 uh, or if there was if there was one over 16 there, there was definitely nothing nothing close to 17 and that I just knew that's not gonna that's not it wasn't gonna have me competitive it's like I ran all the way from from Pohick. I crossed the river with my pedal drive. Uh, Jesus, went over to man! <laughs> I I, yeah, I went to Pomonkey because I I've wanted to go there for you know I fished as a one of those BFLs. Uh, the boater, you know, we went over there, and that year there was really good grass in there. So I was thinking there'd be a grass bed, and I was thinking there's no launches really close to there. So it's kind of one of these areas where I thought I might have it, you know, without any other kayakers around. Um, and it, it didn't really set up kind of how I was thinking it would. So, uh, and then when I saw the weather come in Friday, uh, it was cold and rain. And I was like, you know what? I'm tired. I would be better off. I knew I had fish at that point in Aquia. Uh, I felt pretty good about, you know, that I could have at least one good day down there. And I, I felt like there's no point in going out there and being cold and potentially getting sick and just being exhausted. It's like I, I kind of rested and I drove and looked at some water in different places, but I didn't actually launch. Um, so I was pretty much all in on the choir. And the, I've, I, I know just from, from fishing that area in the past in the spring, it, it tends to be good quality. And the fish that I did catch, um, you know, I think I stuck three down there. And they were they were all kind of the right size, and the ones that I shook off, uh, they they felt you know it's hard to tell. I've, I've had some little fish that that will pull like it's a, a quality one, but I had I had a couple that I shook off that I knew were the right ones. So it was I, I pretty much committed to I wouldn't call it a community hole near a community hole, but it was kind of like you mentioned a sneakier spot that not. I didn't see anybody else. Uh, it's a spot up. within a spot. Um, yeah, because like, I mean, Aquia Creek, uh, you know, as you guys know, like there's like the Wednesday night jackpots every, starting the first, the last week of March until October. There's jackpots that go out of uh, whatever that marina is in Aquia. Hope Springs, I think. I think Hope Springs, yeah. Back so, up in there. Yeah, so like that place gets replenished, just like Mad Woman. Like the 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 three spots would be Lisa Vania, Mad Woman, and Aquia that habitually get restocked with fish. 
Um, and so they're always going to be hotbeds. And, and, and tournaments have been one out of all those. I think Dean Rojas won out of Aquaya back in the day. Uh, and people always cash checks out of Matter Woman. So, uh, I mean, Aquaya is a, is a strong place. And it's, it's always fascinating to me, the more I've done this show, and you have multiple people on from the same tournament, everyone wants to ask about the baits. And it really comes down to the area. Because even if you have the right bait, if you're in the wrong creek, you're not going to catch shit. And it doesn't matter if it's a Potomac tournament, if, if you're going to Sandy Cooper, you got to be around the right quality of fish no matter what. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's definitely the case. You, you could, I caught fish on a lot of different baits on Saturday. And then when I went back through there Sunday, uh, you know, I kind of knew what, what was working, but if you weren't in that right little area, it just, it didn't matter what you threw. You weren't going to get bit. So let's get into day one of the tournament, because I think there's fun strategy, especially on Potomac tournaments. Um, because if you start kicking ass, I guess if there was no one around, lucky you, but someone's probably going to see you pull on something. Like if, did you have to have any kind of gamesmanship to protect the area? I didn't. Um, other than Wednesday when I was in there, uh, the, uh, there were there was definitely one of those Wednesday night jackpots going on. Um, there were a couple guys moving through the area. Everybody was using moving baits, I think. Um, at least the people that were sort of cycling through the grass. Yeah. There were a couple guys that camped on docks. It's like they were adjacent docks, and there was a boat that basically just sat on the dock and just went back and forth around the dock. Wow. Um, so there were a couple guys that were close to me, um, but at that point, I had. I had already switched over to a plastics. I was pitching a missile D bomb. I had the screw lock in it. So I was getting bites and just holding and the fish were shaking. And so even if they were watching me, I don't think they could, they could tell that I was getting bit. Um, and I, I, I didn't stay there that long. I know the tournament probably went on for, I don't know what time it ended, but I'm sure they were there later than I was. Um, so I was I was definitely trying not to swing on anything while while mm -hmm. those guys were around, but I think I only had one kayak come anywhere close to me uh, on Saturday. That's lucky dude wow. during the actual tournament. Yeah, it's uh, I mean there's a ton of water down there, so it and and there were I don't know there might have been ten or fifteen guys uh, launching at that site, but no I boats. no boats came near you. Um, some boats came around. But nobody got nobody got really close. Um, it was, yeah, I, I really, in that way, it was fortunate um, because you. Know, I've, I've had other events where you you get on a group and and there's a couple other people that come in there it's, and it's, it's, yeah, it's New they, Jersey stranglehold. Oh yeah, but I was it was fortunate that this the sort of spot away from the spot or within the spot was just. Um, nobody happened to be over there and uh, and come in on you know, nobody came in on me so that was that was nice so you get in there day one um you, you get out to your spot H how does the day transgress was it basically you you caught all your weight in a quick hurry or was it like a slow steady just chipping away at it it, it happened pretty quick i got bit i started in um into the grass a little before i got to kind of the the area where, where I, I felt like they were concentrated. Um, I started outside of it just with a moving bait through a swim jig and I caught one on my, I don't know, third or fourth cast. And it wasn't a giant, but it, it definitely kind of settled me down. It, it gave me some confidence that, all right, we're, we're around them. We just need to you know, slow down and, and get bites. So it, I don't remember exactly what time it was probably 11 o'clock when I had all my, my weight at that point. Um, so fairly early, this is between 10 and 11. And, you know, I did, I take it back. I had one, one last minute upgrade. And then I had another, I did catch a 17 and a half that was basically identical to the other ones I already had that didn't, didn't help. But pretty much all of it was, was, was fairly early on that outgoing tide. Mm. And that's, I like. I like to fish the, the tail end of the outgoing tide and just as it, it switches and the, it starts to roll back in, um, at least the, the area that I was fishing, that, that seemed to be when I could get bit. I struggled uh, after the water got high. Oh, okay. After the water got high. 
Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Now, do you log all your fish as you catch them, or do you uh, sandbag till the end and you just dump them all? I definitely don't sandbag till the end. Um, I, I guess I do something in between. I, I, it, it sort of depends. Um, like if I've got no cell service, sure, I'm gonna you know have to get off the water early and go somewhere. But for this one, um, I think I waited till I had three. A lot of times I wait till I get five and then and then put them all in. I don't like to catch too many fish uh, before I start uploading because it starts to get if you especially if you catch a bunch of fish that are similar in size, it's hard to figure out which one you submitted and which one you didn't. Um, especially you start to get bad, whether it's rainy or it's super bright and you're having trouble looking at the screen. It just I like knowing, you know, catch one and submit it. But for the Potomac, it, it can really happen fast. Like the, the bite can can happen quick and it can shut off quick. So I I wanted to take advantage of that. I knew the first couple hours were going to be key, and I didn't want to I didn't want to be spending time, uh, you know, playing with the funnel without a bait in the water. I think I think my third bite was a nineteen and a half, probably a I don't know fish in the four or five pound range. Uh, and after I caught that one, I was I was pumped. So I sat down for a minute and I submitted the the fish I'd caught up to that point, and I think I. I submitted each fish after that as I caught it. Because you, you fished three different events, and then just for people at home that aren't familiar, does that mean you had to upload each catch to each individual tournament on the app? Yes and no. There's It's two different – well, for, for this particular tournament or group of tournaments, um, two of the tournaments were on Fishing Chaos, uh, which is, the I guess, a newer app. Uh, Tourney X is the other one. So I had to, I think Fishing Chaos gave me the option to, like when you go to submit your fish for the day, since I was in multiple events, I could like select the events I wanted those fish to go towards. So I, everything I could submit, everything I submitted on Fishing Chaos, you know, went to those, those two tournaments. And then I had to switch to the other app and submit everything on the, the other app for the other tournament. So it, I suppose if all three of them had been on Fishing Chaos, you could just do it once. Uh, but but as it as it worked out, I had to you know mess around and spend a little more time than I, I typically like to you know. Submit it, yeah, like. it's just something to keep in mind because everything's time management. Like you, yeah. you got to keep that stuff in mind. I mean, I remember I had a tournament that I thought I was going to do well in the KBA last year at Shenandoah, and I went to enter my I I kept was it I took pick I got to my third I caught an. 18 or 19 inch smallmouth, and that was my third or fourth of the day and i went to upload it i was like oh shit i have no cell service and i was like really thinking then and it was halfway through the day it's like i gotta make sure i get back and drive out the hell out of this area to get to get to like service and it's just again if you're doing kayak tournaments or you're new to it this is like something that's in your strategy you got to factor in if you're mm -hmm. on the title potomac santi cooper in some areas where you don't have service well how long will it take you to get to it <laughs> I had that on, uh, I went to, to Clear Lake in 2021. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> it was, it's an awesome place. I lived out that way for about a year and I'd, I'd been up there. I think, I think I'd spent three days up there before, but anyway, I went up there and, um, that was, I think the worst service and maybe it was just my carrier and where I was fishing, but I had zero service on the water. I couldn't submit anything. But I, so I found a McDonald's before the tournament that was, I don't know, 15 minutes or so from the ramp. So it was catch your fish and then haul ass back to the, back to the marina, throw everything in the car and drive to try to get everything submitted. So it, it definitely, you know, that the cell service is part of the strategy. Oh, it, 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 yeah, that's so, that's so cool. Devil in the details with that. Um, so then, uh, for, we're still on Saturday. Um, did you fish Sunday as well? I did. I struggled Sunday. Um, I think everyone did. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I got close. I think I was 79, 79 change maybe. Um, and I had that weight early and I, I knew, you know, one solid bite. I had a 14, 14, 14 and a half. I knew a solid 18 or 19 inch fish would jump me up a lot. Um, it just, it didn't happen. Um, I didn't catch any short fish the first day and I had multiple like 10 or 11 inch fish that hit that uh, hybrid hunter for me. You know, the, the bait that was catching the, the tanks for me the first day and I, 
I caught shorts on it the second day. But I, I, uh, I wonder how much that it was that pre front because it, it just seemed like with the boating tournaments and the kayaks, everyone cracked them really well Saturday. And then Sunday, I mean, heck, there's electrical storm until like, I think it was like nine when the, when the lightning stopped where I was at, at Pohick. And it seemed like everyone just struggled a little bit more on Sunday. It, yeah, I think weights were down a little bit. There were, there were some guys at the top that, that oh, still, yeah. that still caught them. But yeah, it was, something was off. There were, I think there were a lot fewer limits that second day. And I, I don't know. A lot of times I'll, I've gotten to a point where it, it's like a mental block for me to go back to the same area on the second day. Because even though I know a place like the Potomac reloads something about, I've, I've had, I've done it too many times where I have a good day in a place and then I go back to it. And I think somehow I just think, well, I caught them all yesterday or I beat it up or there's no more fish left. And um, I, I've, I've had a tendency to not do as well on a second day, but I caught two in the last five minutes I had uh, on Saturday. And I, I felt like there's just, there's more fish in that grass. Um, I, I think for me, part of it was, I think a good number of the fish that I caught, um, I had a bunch of fish that were like cookie cutter 17s. And I think they were spawners. Um, I, I found it was basically holes in the grass on low tide. Um, like on a higher tide, you could see kind of the dirty water and you'd see the grass sticking up. So you, you'd have kind of the dirty, cloudy water around the grass clumps. But at low tide on Wednesday, um, I could actually see the white spots. And I, I don't think it was actually beds, but I think it's like some kind of shell in, mm -hmm. in certain areas. And I pitch into a hole and just dead stick it. It wasn't like they'd hit it right away. You'd pitch it in there and just let it sit. And you, you'd feel it get heavy and they'd start moving off with it. And I, I could be wrong, uh, but I think that some of the fish that were in there were, were spawning in that grass. There were definitely other ones that were not because those fish that that were hitting the hybrid hunter and the swim jig, um, they were away from sort of the the holes that I had marked um, where I, I picked off what I think were individual fish on Saturday. Um, and and I switched it up on Sunday. I, I spent more time with moving baits because I I didn't have I, I, I could have probably pitched the holes in the grass other places. I just I didn't feel like it was super efficient. I felt like with the weather moving baits was the right thing to do on Sunday. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of those females moved. Um, there are some places that of course it didn't happen, but Matta woman is a lot different because structurally, I think a lot of fish will actually winter in Matta woman too, comparatively. It's, mm. it's also a lot more compact, so you can move off and get pre spawners a lot more easy there than like a quiet Belmont that is a little bit bigger and you have to really relocate them. That's my hypothesis anyway. Why Matter Woman's so good is because it's just, it's a much more compact area to break down um, and you can chase them throughout the whole year. Um, but you tip on something so interesting. Why practice on tide is so important and how you pick it is because you can practice on low tide with hopefully some sun so you can actually do better scouting and recon. Um, and that's my, I guess my next question is, did you just use your eyeballs to find these things or did you graph or what tipped you off to that? I was using my eyes. I've been through that general area before and, and had a, what I think was the same bite. Um, I, I remember one fish a couple of years back that it had a weird, you know, the weird black spots, um, but it was a unique marking on its tail. And I remember fishing a frog through the area and having a fish you know, eat the frog. I hooked it. It came off partway to the boat, but I remember seeing that marking and I came back in that exact spot during the tournament and, and caught a fish with the exact markings on the tail. Um, and I think it was just a, a hole in the grass and that fish was, it was either, you know, on the nest or garden fry in there. But, um, but yeah, I, I was looking with my eyes. Um, I definitely, when I, I got on the, on the higher tides, and kind of off away from the bank a little bit in places that I wasn't as familiar with. I was looking at the, at the graph, you know, find, find some of those, those isolated clumps, but it, one of the, uh, what, what, I don't know even know what you call it, but it's by the beach. It used to, 
in the past, I've seen a lot more grass out there and it, it was off. I spent a lot of time out there and, um, I mean, I remember tournaments where there'd be 20 boats all crammed in there and I didn't see a whole lot of boats in there. I caught a couple of catfish in there and I did not get a quality bass bite. I don't even think I had a, a bass bite at all in practice. Uh, out of that, that an area that's traditionally got some better grass in it. But as I went further in the, into the Creek, I found some really healthy grass. And I think that, I think that was the key. It's like, once I got around the right type of grass, um, and you could, some of that stuff was thick enough that you could see it even on the high tide. It was, wow. it was pretty, uh, it was pretty thick, pretty thick. And it, I think it does a nice job of cleaning the water too. Yeah. I mean, and Ignazio on the show, we talked about the importance of SAV, subaquatic vegetation. And, you know, the years that the river has been vaunted is the years that you have the most grass. Um, I mean, hell, I remember again when the beach area was a carpet. And I think I'm, it's either Alton Jones or Dean Rojas was like one of the first people to, to punch in the area because it was such a new technique. And, God, that was such a long time ago. But like that's when the Potomac was on fire, when you had grass all the way in Pohick and DC and all those areas. And guys, it's, it's no shock if you find healthy grass, you're going to find some fish around it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you also tip something else, which is so big brain that a lot of people don't do. And, and you talked about like the boat merry go round where people will throw a chatterbait uh, and go through an area one time and they blast off. But you didn't just fish a moving bait, you actually pick the area apart with a bottom bouncing bait. And I think a lot of people don't, they fish too fast in grass. Yeah. It is. I, I know I do it a lot too. Uh, but it, especially that time of year, I just feel like there's, there's so many holes in the grass. There's so many places for them to be. And I know they eat a chatter bait. They eat the hybrid hunter. They eat a spinner bait, moving baits. But I feel like they see so many of them that, something about those plastics um i just i, I think they're i don't know they're, they're more natural in in some circumstances you don't have necessarily the speed you're not getting a reaction bite but those you know a lazy fish or a fish that's that's just sitting in a hole and that plastic falls down and sits there um i, I think it it's a really easy meal and it's it's something that I, I don't know that they see as much as they see those you know the Everybody knows throw a white chatterbait on Potomac. I mean, that's been the thing for 15, what, twice, as long as the chatterbait's been around. Um, and it still works, but I I like doing stuff that's a little bit different from everybody else if I can. And, and, and it's fishing slow. It, it's the the tournament I had on, on Sunday, my co-angler was, it was so funny. He was like, he, I think halfway through the day, he said like, you're one of the only guys I know that actually uses his power poles not just for docking because we were in Pohick and it was like every 10 feet, put them back down. And then I was just milking the areas, pick them up and move and move and move. Um, but it took me years of getting my ass kicked on the river to know like some, at this time of year, you have to pick shit apart. And there mm -hmm. wasn't the size that, uh, I mean, a choir was, was on fire. Um, but that's what you got to do. But there's so many young anglers and people that don't understand like a chatterbait's great, but the, the next level big brain thing is if you find the, the juice, you got to pick that apart. Yeah. And I, I kind of learned that it, it's not like something new that I figured out. I, I remember back to those fishing as a co-angler. I remember having a good tournament talking to, you know, and just having a good conversation with the boater. And he's like, yeah, that guy over there, he won here last spring and he was just dragging a, basically a Senko type bait on a lightweight, just dragging it through the grass. And I'm like, well, well, that's, you know, that's a boring way to fish. I'm going to fish, <laughs> I'm going to fish a, you know, creature bay or what I'm, I'm going to fish something different, um, you know, on a flipping stick and it, the best tournament that I had, uh, as a, as a co-angler, I, I did with that, what the boater said, I put You're on son of a bitch <laughs> on a stick worm and pitched it in there. And it, it wasn't the most, you know, exciting way to fish. And, I, and I, honestly, I think that's how the guy, um, how Jake won. The, the KBF the first day was pitching a, a Senko or a stick worm on a. We on a make it boat. too complicated, man. We make it way too damn complicated in our brains. We do. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to get that to work. Um, I don't know why it didn't. If it was just, yeah, I don't know. Cause I've, 
I've done that. That's one of the sneaky things that ever since that one tournament, um, I, I throw that just a, a stick worm a lot. I like missiles, uh, quiver worm, uh, the six and a half inch. And sometimes I'll bite a little bit off the head to, to shorten it a bit. But that, I mean, just on a lightweight eighth ounce to three sixteenths, just where it, it'll fall down in the holes and just kind of glide. Um, it's not overpowering. It's just, it's something easy for them to eat. And yeah, I, I think we, we overcomplicate it sometimes. And I, I don't know why I couldn't get bit on that this time. Um, it was definitely more of a, a creature bait. I, I caught them on the, the D bomb when I was pitching and I caught them on the, the, the new chunky D it's like a, how would I describe it? It's a compact uh, kicking style bait. It's kind of like their, their D chunk trailer. It's a beefier version of it, but it's, it's just kind of a more compact flipping bait that has a lot of vibration. Um, so uh, kind of like a rage crawl, just a condensed version of it. And I, I threw that and I threw the D bomb, um, no, no bites on the stick worm, but I, I definitely on that river, any time of year that that is a way to get bites. How long though, did it take you to process the stick worms not moving? I want to, I need to rotate to a new bait. Like, was that a day? Was that an hour? How long did it take you to be like, this isn't working. I got to make a change. Um, I, I think I gave it a, a, a chance a few different times throughout the day because there'd be lulls like for me after 10 o'clock or so, once that tide started to get high, um, I wasn't getting bit on anything uh, where I'd have big long lulls between. So I'd start to experiment more. So it wasn't so much that I threw, you know, the, the stick worm for, you know, hours at a time, but I, I, I picked it up when, when stuff was slow thinking, all right, let me, let me go back through the area with this. And it just, uh, I don't know, maybe a half an hour uh, at times with it. Um, sometimes less than that. Sometimes I just make a couple pitches with it. Uh, yeah, I picked up a big catfish on one, but yeah, <laughs> for whatever reason, the I, I caught some good catfish uh, on day two, but I was I was not able to get the quality bass. I really wonder how much of that was the weather change. I mean, it, it dropped, I think, like three to four degrees, the water temperature from Saturday to Sunday. Hmm. I mean, it had a good drop with how much rain we got. Where I was, the water was up a lot, too. Um, same. Uh, Pohick, the docks were almost flooded. Yeah, there was water up over the... And at first, I was doing a double take. I'm like, I said, like, maybe it was like that yesterday, but it 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 was not. It I think it was with all that water that came in Saturday. I think the high tide was acting like a flood tide. I think so and too. I really, yeah. It was definitely the highest I saw it all week that that Sunday afternoon. Um, it, it it came up high. Dude, Justin, I mean, what's next for you now? Now that you've uh, you, you've cashed checks in so many events this year, it's, it's good vibes for the season. What's next for you? I'm, uh, I'm planning to fish uh, a Hobie up on Cayuga. I have never been on the Finger Lakes. I've, I've been to Champlain once, and that place was, was unreal. Um, I would love to go back to Champlain. But the, the next tournament, I think, is going to be on Cayuga. I, wanna, I don't remember which week. It's, it's June, though. Uh, Hobie's going up there. So I'm, I'm excited to to experience that place. I've seen some of Greg Blanchard's videos and I know, uh, you know, Bailey's done really good up there. It's, uh, I know it's got some giants, so I'm hoping I can run into a few. That place is freaking awesome. And then the last thing, what is clear Lake like, I saw Matt Allen's like earlier stuff there. It looks like a paradise for donkeys. It, it is. It's, uh, the times that I've fished it have been later in the year. I think it was right before, you know, I left my, my job in California and moved back east. Um, I drove up there for a couple of days and it just, there was a ton of grass. Uh, the frog bite was awesome. You know, punch bite was awesome. And the fish reminded me a little bit of the Potomac fish, the way they were built. They were just that thick, thick fish and they fight hard. I, I don't know how, how else to describe it, but there, I feel like there's some places where the fish just fight different. And that's one of those places where 
I had a five pounder there that I, I would have sworn was a seven or an eight, just so strong. Um, and I've, I know that there were a couple of kayak events there last year and it was off for whatever reason. I know they had a drought for a couple of years. Uh, from what I've heard, the fishing has picked back up this year, but it's the times that I were there was, was there. It, it was, uh, it, it was pretty fun. Uh, for, for me flipping, you know, punching a big heavy weight through matted grass and throwing a frog. That's, it doesn't get much better than that. And when you're catching a bunch of, you know, three plus pound fish, it's, it's fun. What is the biggest bass that you have so far? I have a uh, nine and a half is, is the biggest. I've got one other one over nine and then, uh, you know, obviously more as you get lower, but still looking for my first double digit. Nine's not too shabby. Was that West coast? Uh, I had one, one was in California, actually bank fishing a pond in the middle of Los Angeles. No uh, way. I need to hear the story. Uh, I need to hear the story. It, I was, uh, I stopped by there. I think it was a Sunday afternoon and was just walking the banks. I was thinking, all right, maybe there'll be some spawning fish I can see. And it's this, I don't even know what you, I think it's called Echo Park. It's I, I, I'm maybe 10 acres, 15. It's not big. Uh, they, they have these little, um, what do you call them? Like the little pedal boat deals, like these big, they've got in Los Angeles? something on. Yeah. And, and like downtown LA, um, like one, one section of the, of the park is like a homeless encampment, <laughs> but I was walking the bank and I found, uh, you know, I found one and pitched in and caught it. I think it was I don't know, three to four, went a little further and the, it's kind of right on the edge of this this pad field. And I thought I saw one that was comparable. I thought maybe it's five, uh, but it was, it was choppy on the surface. I couldn't see it real well. I decided to come back the next day after work. When I got there, there's a lady fly fishing for it. I think she hooked it in the back at one point with a little tiny fly hook and it, you know, popped out. But I, I just sat there. Um, I don't even think I cast. I just, I, I stood a ways off from her. So she had plenty of room. But I just waited probably 45 minutes for her to get tired of, uh, of not catching it. And when she left, I went over and it probably took 30 minutes. Weird fish, too. You know, it wasn't it, there was an area that it kind of kept circling around that I thought was the bed. And I, I kept pitching in there and I, I just happened to be paying attention. I, I made a bad cast and I'm you know basically burning the bait back. And uh, I see all of a sudden the fish is interested and the fish follows it. Follows it almost to my feet, um, and I just killed the, the little lizard, killed it at my feet, and the fish noses down and ate it, and oh my bolts God. for water. And I, I still thought it was a five, and I lean into it, and you know it's running out into the lake. There was a guy playing uh, a guitar and like singing, like walking along the bank. He's like right in the way, and like the fish is swimming like around him, and I'm trying to like I'm trying not to be a jerk and be like get out of the way. <laughs> But uh, he was just kind of in his own world playing. And I'm just, you know, the fish is, is pulling drag. It tries to jump and only got about half out of the water. But I'm still thinking, I'm like, how is this five pound fish this strong? And it really wasn't until I got it in, you know, I had to lay down on this concrete. I don't know, it was probably a two foot drop to the water. I'm laying down on the concrete in the bird poop, reaching down and uh, get my hand on it. When I start to lift it, I'm like, whoa. And it's kind of as it's coming out of the water that I realized that thing was a lot heavier than, than I thought. Dude. Pretty, pretty fun. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, and it, it's a pretty popular park. There's not a whole lot of outdoorsy stuff um, you know, in the city. So everybody's out there enjoying the sunshine and the water. And, you know, all these people come flocking around looking at this fish. And it was, uh, it was pretty fun. Justin, I can't top that. That's freaking awesome. I just, uh, that's gotta be a feeling in the world to have an audience of people and homeless people watching you. Uh, bring oh, yeah. it down it's, it's nice when you have people take it, they can take a picture for you. So I, I got some good pictures and uh, released it and hopefully she's still in there. Justin, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to family sponsors, friends? Yeah, definitely want to thank family. Mom and dad are probably my biggest fans. They watch, uh, they watch on tourney X and fish and chaos and kind of keep me motivated. Um, got to thank missile baits. Um, I rely on them a ton. Uh, this tournament, you know, the only only thing I caught fish on that wasn't a missile bait 
was that uh, hybrid hunter. Um, I want to thank Vicious, uh, Vicious Fishing. Uh, I use their line exclusively, Quantum Rods and Reels, and then uh, Dakota Lithium. Um, I've partnered with them this year. I uh, really like their batteries, lightweight lithium stuff. Um, if, if you're in a kayak, that weight makes a big difference. And, and lithium versus lead, it's, it's night and day. It, it really is. And especially for kayak fishing, you need that light advantage 100%. Again, guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm to help us grow so we can have more guests, we can have higher quality production. A link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please try to follow Justin on his career path as he continues for glory. And we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. We might be talking some more, but we're done here. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.